Greetings, everyone. It's nice to have you with us. We will start in just a moment and give another minute for others to sign in. Please be patient and thank you. Okay, welcome everyone again. Uh, we do have a lot of content to cover, so let's go ahead and get started. And hopefully, if others are going to join, they can catch up uh, through the recording or uh, just by listening. Great. Thanks, Greg. Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Ensuring Quality Products During Emergencies, Part 1, principles of quality assurance. So this is the first part of a two-part series focusing on quality assurance in the context of humanitarian and emergency settings. We are very happy that you can join us today and we hope that the contents of the webinar will be interesting and useful. My name is Barbara Lamphere and I'm joined by my colleague, Greg Roche to present this webinar. Uh, many of you know us, but Greg, will you please introduce yourself? Sure, Barbara, I'd be happy to. Welcome again, everyone. I'm Greg Roche. I'm a senior technical advisor at JSI, and I work in all areas of uh, support in supply chain management, uh, assessment, implementation, um, training, and capacity building, and so forth. Nice to be with you again. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. And um, as I said, I'm Barbara Lamphier, and I've spent the past 35 or more years working in supply chain um, management for a variety of different kinds of programs, including reproductive health and immunization programs and family planning programs, and now humanitarian and response settings um, programs. Uh, my expertise is in organizational development and capacity building. And I'm so happy to be here with you today to present this, this webinar. As we get started, feel free to introduce yourselves to everybody else using the chat function in Zoom. You can get to know each other a little bit. Um, and we should have some time at the end of the webinar for some questions. You please, when you, when you ask a question, please use the Q&A button found at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions. Uh, don't use the chat function. And the reason we ask you to do this is we would like to follow up with questions, with your questions if we don't get to everybody after the webinar and the Q&A function will give us a recording of all the questions that are, that are asked. So please use the Q&A function. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Barbara. So let's get started with the quick introduction and overview for today's webinar. First of all, we always want to remind you that this webinar is made possible through the USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, or BHA, Capacity Building Program, and the program is implemented by JSI Research and Training Institute, Incorporated. The overall aim and the objectives of the program are shown here on the slide. Please take a few minutes to read, or a moment to read, sorry. We noted that this is the part one webinar on quality assurance, and here are the objectives for this webinar. So during this webinar, we will define quality assurance as a principle and how we will apply it during the webinar. We'll identify products that are typically associated with or used during an emergency rep response or humanitarian crisis. We'll relate quality assurance principles in the context of humanitarian and emergency response to quality assurance principles in general. We'll discuss quality assurance principles as they relate to both pharma and non-pharma products. We'll identify some resources that are available for you all for additional information on quality assurance. 
and we'll provide instructions for our usual post-webinar game. As a preview to the part two webinar, the objectives that we cover today will be followed by the objectives that you see here. Essentially, next time we'll go into more detail around quality assurance actions that we as supply chain managers can take at all stages of the logistics cycle as listed here. The part two webinar is tentatively scheduled for August 24th and we'll send out reminders and information on registering prior to that date. So back to today's objectives to start with a uh, general introduction to quality assurance. We'll have an observation. We'll talk generally about aspects related to quality assurance. The main focus will be on product quality as we see reflected in the second and fourth objectives that are highlighted in the list. We'll of course not be able to cover all aspects of quality assurance, including quality control, quality management, and other aspects in detail for all types of products that might be needed in response to an emergency situation or humanitarian crisis. But we'll do our best to cover general principles that can be applied to many, if not all different product categories. Let's start by asking the question, what is quality insurance? So let's look at a basic definition of quality assurance. Here is one basic di dictionary definition of quality assurance. Quality assurance is the maintenance of a desired level of quality in a service or product, especially by means of attention to every stage of the process of delivery or production. Since we are focusing on product quality during this webinar series, we're focusing on aspects of quality assurance more directly to the quality of the finished products. We will not be discussing aspects of process quality. If you have specific questions related to process quality, we can look at those if we have time during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. Here's a reminder of the importance of the supply chain in ensuring commodity security. And this would be for any situation, including an emergency or humanitarian context. In the quote on the left, you will notice the highlighted phrase focusing on the importance of providing quality health supplies. We also see on the right, a reminder of the six rights of logistics. We are not surprised to find that the right condition, in other words, products of good quality um, is among the six rights. We can think quickly about what we might mean by quality assurance for humanitarian settings. For this, we only mean that we're focusing on the products that are most often found in emergency or humanitarian situations. Before we go into the topic though, let's see about your programs or organizations and product quality assurance. We'll try to open a quick poll. So I believe you can see the poll. So the questions are two. First, yes or no, does your program or your organization have a system in place for quality control of the products that you purchase, supply, or otherwise manage? Please say yes or no. And I see people are already answering the second question, not surprising. If you do have a quality assurance measures, which ones do you have in your program? And we have some listed laboratory testing, visual inspection, review manufacturer test results, rely on supplier. Or if you have something else that you include in your program, please write your other quality assurance measure in the chat. We'd love to hear your different inputs. So please take a moment to answer the questions. Um, we'll give uh, roughly another minute. It looks like about half of the attendees have uh, answered, so please take another moment. Okay, another 10 seconds.
Okay, I'll go ahead and close the poll now. Thanks to all who were able to vote. So I hope you can see the results. So out of the people who answered, we had about 133 people. Wow, that's fantastic. It looks like 91% of you do have quality assurance or quality control pro, uh, uh, aspects in your programs. And we see that the biggest one that's mentioned is visual inspection of products. That's a great one. That's easy for us to do as supply chain managers. We also have people doing uh, reviewing test results. We have the other uh, options as well by almost half of the, the participants. And some of the other um, so, um, input from the chat um, also includes that they have quality assurance policies and procedures, as well as uh, many of them have defined quality criteria. Um, check for expiration dates on a routine basis, those kinds of, of other activities. All right, great. So hopefully you'll be able to contribute through the chat or through your questions. And uh, let's go ahead and continue with, the, um, with our content for today. Thanks again for participating in the chat. So here's a variety of pictures that represent products being managed in different emergency situations or in humanitarian crisis. And from these pictures, we just get a really general idea. Really the products that we might find in a humanitarian setting can end up being any products that we need, maybe in any situation. But for us, let's think about products that are more typically needed to respond to emergencies or humanitarian situations. These would generally be products that we need quickly and in large quantities but which also may be needed in other countries, depended, de, excuse me, depending on the severity or reach of the emergency. In this context, we might think about events such as outbreaks, epidemics, or pandemics, emergencies that affect a large population, but a population that is mostly in place, or events such as natural disasters, such as earthquake or cyclone, or man-made disasters, such as civil war, which can still affect a large population, but more likely a population that is or that becomes displaced. So then we ask, well, what kind of products are we talking about? What products are needed? So let's think first about disease outbreaks, such as those that occur during an epidemic or a pandemic. Certainly with the current COVID crisis and recent events such as Ebola and even Zika, these are certainly on our minds. So for this, we might have a lot of focus on the types of products that are listed here for medical care, products for home use, and also not forgetting that even during an emergency, we still need to provide some level of routine health care. So those needs do not go away in an emergency. In this context as well, we can also think about kits, such as cholera kits, reproductive health kits, and others that we talked about in more detail during one of the quantification webinars. We can also think about products that are in high demand during other kinds of disasters, such as natural and man-made. And again, we have certain types of products that are needed to respond to different kinds of disasters. And again, we have to try to assure routine medical care at the same time. To summarize here, in an emergency situation or a humanitarian context, we can find that we are managing any and all products needed not even only to respond to the humanitarian situation or to the immediate emergency, but also those that are needed just to maintain some level of daily life and routine healthcare. So while some products will depend on the specific type of emergency and the type of response needed, the geographical areas and population affected or other specific considerations, this could equally be any and all products needed to live, housing, such as tents or other temporary shelter, food and water, equipment, healthcare products, including medicines, medical equipment, reproductive health products, personal protective equipment, and so on. So when we think of emergencies, we often think first about pharmaceutical products, those that are needed to treat diseases or medical conditions or other related medical products. And there are also 
non-pharmaceutical or even non-medical products that we might be dealing with. Let's see if we can make some distinctions related to those types of products and product quality assurance here. I think that one statement we can generally make about all products, whether we were talking about pharmaceuticals or non-pharmaceuticals or even non-medical products is that product quality assurance will be based on product specifications. We have minimum acceptable standards for our products that are reflected in those specifications. Since we define all of these specifications for products, we are buying, distributing, and using, and sometimes we have to rely on others to do this. Regardless of who is defining the specifications though, in the end, we judge the quality of products against these specifications. So let's look at some typical specifications for different examples of pharmaceutical products and non-pharmaceutical medical products. And let's see how we might apply our quality assurance to these. Um, we note on the slide that non-medical products would of course also have specifications, but we're not gonna cover non-medical products in this webinar. So let's first think about pharmaceutical products. For these, we can think of pharmacopoeial specifications, which simply means the collection of specifications um, of chemical substance for pharmaceutical use. In other words, the standards for the product. Some of those are listed here. We won't go into detail on any of these other than to identify them for our needs and to emphasize that these are all elements of product quality and related to product quality assurance. This web link on the slide with the slides, which we will share with you um, in the follow-up email, the web link shows one source of additional information for specifications of chemical substances for pharmaceutical use. We can also think of general specifications that are applicable to a pharmaceutical as well as other products. And some of those are listed here. Some such as shelf life, required storage conditions and others are probably familiar to us all. Others such as product stability, we are not only less familiar with, but are also less likely to be able to do testing for. However, for information in this case, in layman's terms, stability refers to how well a pharmaceutical can remain in the same specification the physical, chemical, microbiological, toxicological, protective and informational specifications state as it was developed. So maintaining that state is its stability. Again, we won't go into detail on these other than to identify them as components of our technical specifications for the products and to emphasize that we can refer to these when doing product quality assurance. Now, however, let's think about what we can do in terms of verifying the product specifications and which of these we actually can monitor ourselves. If we think about some of the specifications listed here, we cannot set the shelf life of the product, but we can verify that the product still has shelf life remaining, that it is not expired. We cannot determine the temperature sensitivity, but we can ensure temperatures are maintained during storage. And we can verify the packaging, ensure that all labels are correct and make corrections if needed and so on. And when we get back to the pharmacopoeial specifications, the ability to check product quality in terms of these specifications will definitely require advanced machinery and the skill to run those machines. We can take polymorphism as one example. If you're not aware, polymorphism is the ability of an active pharmaceutical ingredient compound to exist in two or more formations. Sometimes one version may have different properties than another, such as different effectiveness or different metabolism. Testing for polymorphism would require machinery to do exit ray, diffraction, nuclear magnetic resonance and other tests, things that are much more complicated than we normally do in our supply chain management activities. So we likely will not be conducting these kinds of tests ourselves, but we'll rely on others to do so. 
And in fact, we should also point out here that tests such as these would normally be done as part of the quality control process at manufacturing and not be a component of a quality assurance process further down the supply chain that we are focusing on here. Thinking briefly about specifications for medical products that are not pharmaceutical in nature, we can take the example of examination gloves. These also have different types of specifications, those that are much more technical as shown in the upper list, such as tensile strength or palm thickness, and those that are more commonly used by us by non-scientific staff that are those in the lower list. When thinking about these specifications for examination gloves, we as supply chain personnel will be more likely to think in terms of the second list, the less scientific list, although certainly we would expect that at some point during the product selection process, qualified staff did provide input on those more technical specifications to ensure that they will be appropriate for use in our context. And then thinking about product quality assurance, again, for the example product of examination gloves, as we saw for pharmaceutical products, there are some specifications that we may not be able to test for ourselves, such as those technical ones in the upper list. Testing things like tensile strength and palm thickness and weight would certainly require more technical equipment. However, we can still verify the product labels to ensure the minimum standards are reflected. And we can still look for things like expiration dates and other aspects. For the other specifications at the bottom, we should certainly be able to verify those by visual inspection or manual inspection. We've seen in our current, uh, excuse me, we've seen in our previous examples of pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical medical products that intensive quality assurance measures oftentimes rely on the ability to do chemical or other analysis that requires specialized equipment. And in our context, we may not have access to such equipment. But we have also touched on another thing that we can do regularly to help ensure product quality, which is simple visual inspection of our products, the one that many of you mentioned in the poll that you use. So just to review, when we talk about visual inspection or visual examination, we're looking at the products in order to detect any quality problems that can be seen with our eyes, very simple. We can do visual inspection each and every time we're handling our products. When we receive them from the supplier, when we're putting them into or taking them out of storage, or when they're being loaded or unloaded into trucks for transport. Sometimes we'll be looking at the products in more detail, such as when receiving them into the country. We want to ensure that the very product adheres to our specifications. So we can open a carton, open a box, and look at the individual products inside. During storage and transport, on the other hand, we may just verify the condition of the cartons or boxes. And then if we see any signs of damage with those, we would then take a closer look in detail at the products inside the boxes. And of course, it's important to realize or to, uh, to make sure that health workers and pharmacists know what the product should look like. What color is it supposed to be? What does it, is it supposed to smell like? What's the acceptable types of packaging uh, if the product comes from more than one source and so on, so that they can detect those kinds of quality problems through visual inspection. As we see in the pictures in these examples and in the list, there are a number of product quality pro problems that can be identified through simple visual inspection. We can even think about identifying some of these aspects in our product specifications for procurement, such as requiring that the product label or pack indicate what color the product is supposed to be. In this way, we'll be more easily able to detect some problem with quality, even without a full chemical analysis. And if we do de detect possible problems with product quality and we're still unsure, we could then submit the products for further analysis or testing to verify whether the product is still suitable for use or not. 
We've been talking about product quality assurance based on the different types of products, pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical products, for example. We also want to touch briefly on a few other aspects of product quality assurance. And for us in our context, one of these would be related to products that are procured internationally and those that are procured locally. The main message that we want to convey here is that we need to ensure that we do product quality assurance, either by doing it ourselves when that is possible, if it's conducting our own laboratory testing or visual inspections, for example, as we were just talking about, or by other means. In other cases, particularly for international procurements that are managed by others, we may need to depend on those reliable partners, such as donors, manufacturers, stringent regulatory authorities, or others from other countries or others. What you may find is that in the emergency or humanitarian context, we have more reliance on those external quality control processes, such as through pre-qualified suppliers, particularly if dealing with funding sources that themselves use those suppliers. So in that case, you would have less reliance on in-country resources for product quality assurance. Although of course, you would still have some role once the products are received in your country and they're being distributed. And again, we'll go into more detail related to several of these aspects, including visual inspection, use of pre-qualified suppliers and other elements during the part two webinar. Let's now look quickly at one application of product quality assurance principles. We had a reminder earlier about the importance of the supply chain and ensuring commodity security. And we agree generally that we do product quality insurance to ensure that we have quality products for our clients. But we can also think about some instances where product quality issues take on even greater importance. Let's look at one of those cases now. Product quality insurance is especially important in that it can be one of the weapons we use to detect counterfeit or substandard products or even deter them from getting into our system. As we see here, substandard and counterfeit are two different things. While both present problems in terms of quality, with a substandard medicine, the manufacturers generally would be known, just that the product has some detected deficiencies in terms of quality. So for example, a substandard medicine may have less active pharmaceutical ingredient that is required by its specifications and therefore would be less effective. For the counterfeit products, we do not know who the manufacturer is, which would be an even greater cause for alarm in terms of quality. The product could be made of almost anything. For both counterfeit and sub -counter, substandard products, we do have actions we can take to verify product quality. For the elements related to pharmacopoeial specifications, our only recourse is likely to quarantine the products while they are sent to a lab for analysis. But even in the absence of that measure, we can rely on visual inspection for some elements. So for example, the packaging, including the marking and labeling may show signs that the product is not genuine. Perhaps the required seal is missing or of wrong quality. Perhaps the package colors are wrong or the logos are misrepresented. Perhaps the font is the wrong size or style. And sometimes the words on the package may be misspelled. Those are all clues that, there, that there's, a pro there's a problem here. And in addition to visual inspection, we can do even more. Let's, let's look at one example now. Here is an article on the DevX website. If you're not familiar with it, DevX is an independent news organization and media platform for the global development community. So this article appeared um, through DevX. This article describes a collaboration between Nigeria's National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control and the three technology companies to use a mobile phone app to authenticate drugs 
that are at risk of counterfeiting. So drugs such as antibiotics, antimalarials, and diabetes medica medications. The process involves finding a code on the drug pack and texting it to a number that confirms whether the medication has been authenticated by the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control. So um, you would receive this package. Generally, there's a, a scratch off. You scratch off the, the uh, over the labeling and it reveals a number and you text that number in. And if, if it's verified by the um, NAFDAC, then it's an authentic product. So here's an example related to assuring quality, product quality that goes quite beyond simple packaging measures or visual inspections. According to the article, the incidence of counterfeit antimalarial drugs decreased from 19.6% counterfeit antimalarial drugs in 2012 down to 3.5% in 2015. So it did have a good, a good effect. During the part two webinar, we will also hear about other things that countries and programs can do in the area of product quality assurance. Great, thanks, Barbara. And speaking of the part two webinar, we before we close off this webinar, we would like to give you a very brief preview of what we might be covering or what we will be covering in the part two webinar that will follow. And again, it's tentatively scheduled for August 24th, but you'll be receiving an announcement and a registration link before then. But what can we expect to find in that webinar? So we had shown these objectives that we will plan to cover during the webinar part two. Let's see one example of what that means and how the topic might be covered. So let's take one example when we think about the procurement process, which is part of the overall logistics cycle. We would ask ourselves, what can we do at our level as part of our procurement process to better assure the quality of the products that we will eventually purchase and receive. So here are just a few ideas. In essence, we're saying that in our role of doing quality assurance, we are going to have the manufacturer or the supplier demonstrate that they have done the necessary quality control at their level during production and that their facilities adhere to good manufacturing processes. I believe we even heard this as one of the suggestions from a participant during the poll. To go even a step further, we can include such kind of requirements and vendor selection criteria in our tendering documents. So in the tendering documents, we would publish that we are, only, we are putting an emphasis on manufacturers or suppliers that can demonstrate that they follow good manufacturing practices. So again, during the part two webinar, we'll be talking about actions we can take throughout the logistics cycle to help assure product quality, procurement like the example we just gave, but also other areas such as product selection, warehousing and distribution and so forth. Let's look quickly at a few additional resources that are available to get more information about product quality assurance. As one of the additional resources that we want to highlight, there is an organization called QAMED. QAMED is a not-for-profit membership association. Our objective, their objective, excuse me, is to increase access to quality medicines through pharmaceutical audits, training, and advisory services. You can see the strategic areas that are noted here on the slide. QAMED also offers services such as audits, technical visits, local market assessments, technical assistance, and training. And you can find more information on QAMED and even information on how to join uh, in the link that we show and that we will share. Here is a short list of organization website landing pages where you can start searching for other additional information on quality assurance. Each of these organizations that are listed is a recognized national or international organization that works with health products and that can provide reliable information on products and product quality assurance. 
And here are a few other resources that you can access online, still within the context of recognized international organizations. And again, we'll share all of these links with you after the webinar. So as we have done after every webinar that we have presented through this project, we are offering you the chance to refresh your um, knowledge of the key messages from the webinar by playing an online game. Um, so let me provide some information about the game and um, that, that will be available after the webinar is completed. All right, um, what you need to play the game is a, a computer or a mobile phone with an internet connection, any internet web browser except for Opera, all the rest will work, and of course your desire to play and to learn. This information will be provided to you after the uh, webinar with our follow-up email as well, but you will go to this link. You would create an account for yourself and use the registration code 8001 to click on the account. And the game that you're playing would be ensuring quality products during emergencies part one. Um, there will be also a game for the part two webinar. So when you go to the game site, you will see a screen that looks like this and you'll press play. And um, there are many other games, but this is the one in the, in the site, but this is the one related to this webinar, ensuring quality products during emergencies. When you get into the game, you'll notice that the game is multiple choice. Um, if there are others online at the same time, you can play in competition with the um, other people or you can play alone. If you're playing with others online, I encourage you to use the jackpot button in the upper right hand corner of the game screen and that will give you extra points to um, towards um, your total points for the game. If you get the answer right, you might double your points in some cases even more points. But if you get the answer wrong, you lose your points and the other player who's in the game at the same time um, will, can uh, retrieve your points. So um, we hope that you will be able to uh, play the game and enjoy it and, um, and it will help prepare you for participation in the next webinar um, when we go to the part two of quality assurance. Okay, great. Thanks, Barbara. And yes, we encourage everyone to please play the game and review the material. So this is the end of the webinar. Today, we have defined quality assurance as a principle and how it was applied during our webinar. We identified products that are typically associated with or used during an emergency response. We related quality assurance principles in the context of humanitarian and emergency response to quality assurance principles in general. We discussed quality assurance principles as they relate to both pharma and non-pharma products. We identified resources that are available for additional information on quality assurance, and Barbara just provided you the instructions for the post-webinar game. And as we hoped, we do have time for questions. So let's look at some questions that have come in. And please remember to use the Q&A function to ask a question uh, and not to put it in the chat because we need to keep track of these questions so that we can answer other ones uh, after the webinar as needed. So I will start, uh, look at the first question and here comes, uh, in the absence of strong SRAs in some humanitarian settings, what is a minimum quality standard that purchasers of pharma products should meet? So of course, I need to ask, what exactly do you mean with SRA? Stringent regulatory authorities, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Strin you see, I have too many things going on in my mind. So in the absence of a strong stringent regulatory authorities and some humanitarian, what is a minimum quality standard? Well, uh, what's a minimum quality standard that, that purchasers should meet? That one. And feel free I, if anybody wants to contribute in, in the in, chat to answer questions. But when you... In when the you, chat, please do. You know, we can rely on, if you're doing international procurement, you can rely on um, the, S, the other SRAs like WHO pre-qualified 
um, vendors um, and, and WHO specifications for products. WHO does have some specifications listed. And I also want to invite uh, Nadia Olson, who is the um, manager for this product to uh, also join. She's on the panel now and she can also um, join us in this um, discussion. So thanks. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, um, Barbara, I'm here. Yes, of course, great. Um, looking at. Good, Do, um, okay, thank you. Anything else you wanna to add to that, to that, um, to answer that question? Sorry, I'm having a bad connection, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to log back into the Zoom, see if I okay. can get through. Okay, great, well, why don't we move on then? Okay, thanks. So the next question I see, um, is what is the difference between quality assurance and quality control? They are mostly used commonly together. Yeah, so the way we're trying to make a distinction, uh, the way we've tried to distinguish in our presentation is quality control, if for us, we're saying is the one that's done at the point of manufacturing or during the manufacturing process. So the manufacturer is gonna control the quality of the primary ingredients. They're gonna control the percentages that are being mixed to come up with the final product. They're gonna be controlling the final quality of that product as it comes off of the production line. For us, quality assurance is something that we can do as supply chain managers farther down in once the products arrived in our country, for example, what can we do to help assure the quality of that product? Barbara, do you wanna add anything? No, that's, that sounds good to me and generally, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question and we also have some answers in the um, Q&A. Um, counterfeit drugs are very common. There's a couple of other uh, comments about uh, counterfeit uh, drugs. What, no significant steps taken from the original companies to stop the products. What steps are necessary and realistic? So this one, I think it depends on, to me, I would look at two different things. One, obviously the original company, the original manufacturer who owns the patent maybe, or who's producing the product has an interest in ensuring that the product is of good quality in the marketplace because they don't want the counterfeit product or the substandard product to be linked back to their facility. So they should have an interest in trying to control the spread of counterfeit, <coughs> excuse me, or substandard products. The next step to me would be at the country level that the country folks have to be very strict on allowing products into the country or not, making sure that the products are coming from the qualified manufacturer, making sure that they have the proof of quality uh, testing or that they can do the quality testing on arrival. So that's the way I would look at those two levels uh, in terms of um, combating the, uh, the counterfeit. And then the one that Barbara mentioned in the presentation is the effort that they're doing in Nigeria which is having that thing all the way down to the purchaser of the product can scratch the code, text the code and verify that that is a genuine product. So those are a couple of different steps um, that can be taken. Great. Okay. Uh, add to that. So that's, um, that's good. It's just, Okay, um, the links to we'll share with you. I, you know, one of the things you know with the with the counterfeit products is that there's such a huge um, obviously profit um, motive here, and so there's a lot of the economics of it that need to be considered as well. So I think in the follow up email we'll share a few links on um, counterfeit the the efforts to. Um, to combat counterfeit products in other countries, in particularly in humanitarian settings and, and other um, and, and development settings. So I think we can share some more additional materials there. Um, I think uh, there have been a couple of questions about um, the links to the materials and so forth. I just want to say that at, in our follow-up email, you will get a copy of all the, you'll get the slides with the links, um, the instructions for the game, and all the uh, everything that and probably some additional um, some additional materials as well from us. So, um, Greg, I, can you read the French one for me? <laughs> uh, let me 
Fine. Okay. The if I'm reading the right one that you're referring to is how do you get the registration code for EPA? Okay. We will send that out in the follow up in the follow up beam. The registration code is eight zero zero one, but we will we will send that out full instructions so that you'd be able to get into it with no um, with no problem. Um, so no worries. You'll get that in your follow up email. If you're if you're on if you've registered for this webinar, you will get it. So you obviously are. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I, here's another one. Uh, at what stage do we do quality assurance and quality control? For us, the quality control is farther up at the manufacturing stages, and quality assurance is throughout the supply chain, even in country, um, once the products have been received and they're making their way down to the service yeah. delivery point. So that's the distinction that we're trying to make. Um, here's a uh, and, and just, you know, quality assurances are responsibility at every point of the supply chain. So when, when you know, you think of yourself as a supply chain manager, and this will be covered extensively in part two webinar, like, what are you doing um, to, um, what can you do to ensure the quality of the product at every, at every stage when you're handling it, when you're issuing it, what's, when you're actually procuring it in the specifications? And we we have talked a lot about you know we we've, we've had some discussion now about visual inspection and I do want to say that um, I think it's really important that um, that when we're working with healthcare providers or any or supply chain managers storekeepers that the storekeepers and healthcare providers know what the product should look like when it's in good quality. So that when you're training them or that they that they're from that as part of their training, they become familiar with every product. They know what, what the product should smell like, what color it should be, its hardness, all the physical aspects of the product, so that so that they can detect when there's a problem, you know, if or if there's been a change of supplier, maybe the the tablet that used to be white is now yellow, and that's okay. That's the color it's supposed to be. So I think you're, it's really important to provide the people who are handling those products with information about what those products look like in good quality so they can detect when they're in bad quality. So thanks, sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks. And we, just, I, we do have a comment, the, the questions, we appreciate all the questions. They are getting very technical, more technical maybe than supply chain folks like us can address. We'll try to answer as many as we can. We will likely take some of the questions offline and try to address them after expert consultation. And we can post uh, answers in IAPHL and or the Humanitarian Commodities Logistics, the HCL um, subsection of uh, IAPHL. So let's, um, we'll continue going through. Uh, coming back to the counterfeit drugs, how can you differentiate between them if it's your first time to deal with them? Essentially, I think it comes down to knowing what the product is supposed to be, look, what it's supposed to look like. So from catalogs, you can see what the packaging should look like, the size of the font, the type of font, the colors from the specifications, you should be able to know what maybe the insert, uh, package inserts are supposed to, look like because you've asked for that, you've asked for the product for the cartons to be um, to be marked in some way. So essentially it's knowing, again, coming back to that idea of the specifications, knowing what the basic specifications are for the products and the ones that you can look at or look for when you're looking at the product. Exactly. So um Yeah, I was just looking at this one. I'm not sure if we can answer the one about the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, <laughs> there's a question, um, no, I've lost it. They're coming in so fast and furious, but that, that some of our vaccine, like the vaccines for COVID that are many are not actually uh, qualified. And actually several of them are not, are, you know, our emergency use or have emergency youth, use authorization. Um, and they are, they are shared. Um, you know, in many of these vaccines, though, have gone through rigorous testing, um, big clinical trials, and so while they may not be fully, um, fully, you know, FDA approved or whatever the local stringent regulatory requirements, I think that in most cases we can have confidence 
in in the vaccines that are available to us. So, yeah, I think this one is this is Nadia. Uh, thank you, Barbara. I think this this one is challenging, and it it it's true for any pharmaceutical that would be developed quickly. You know, it takes some time for all of the different countries and authorities to recognize uh, a new medication and also, you know, go through the proper process of, of really deciding what their poly is, policy is relative to that new pharmaceutical. And every country has different levels of stringency. And, and that's why you're going to see some discrepancies. Um, of, obviously, in an ideal world, all the regulatory and pol policies would be harmonized ac across the earth, you know, but that speaks to many other problems we have in our societies. So, you know, it's a practical issue and time is the essence. And so I think in this case, a lot of decisions were made to, um, in, um, you know, prioritize access um, but of course, that, that means that not every country has time to, to verify. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna apologize now. I'm gonna pick and choose among the questions. So there's one that asks, um, do we have to be a certified pharmacist to do QA? Someone's already written in the answer, no. And I completely agree. There are certainly things, any person who looks at a carton can tell if the carton if the products are leaking. Any person who looks at a carton can tell if the carton is smashed. And if the carton is smashed or 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 punctured, then that should that would indicate possible problems with the quality of the products inside. For other aspects like the efficacy or some perhaps some other elements, you would need to be a pharmacist. But certainly uh, visual inspection can a lot of elements can be detected through simple visual inspection not requiring to be a pharmacy specialist. Um, I will also, there was another question that caught my eye. Um, in the reality at the facility level, we do quality control of pharmaceutical products by visual inspection, but others are fake products without innovation like barcode. It's difficult to confirm or control such fake products when we receive them. So how do we control such products at the facility level? So I think there's two things. One is if the facility is actually doing the purchase of the product, let's say on the local market, then you would have to have relative uh, trust in the supplier that you're purchasing from. But also just for general, if the products are coming through your own system from the central level down to the facility, the facility is not the first place where quality control should have taken or quality assurance measures should have been taken. Those should have been taken at the central level when they're received. And if there were any issues related to pro, uh, quality assurance, they should have been investigated or tried to be dealt with at the central level. If they move down a level and someone else notices something wrong or possibly wrong, then they would have. So it shouldn't be, I mean, maybe it is, or, or pro probably it is uh, in, in reality, um, the reality on the ground that you're faced with the problem. So you can do what you can, but also keeping in mind that hopefully the folks above you in the supply chain have also done their role in quality assurance. So there are a couple of, there's, there are a couple of questions um, that um, I think we could answer fairly quickly here. How essential is it to create a drug and therapeutics committee can they contribute to the quality assurance of pharmaceuticals? Definitely. Um, you know, the any time that people are together and sharing data and problem solving to data problem solving together is is a good thing. And so the drug and therapeutics committee is a is an um, is a great avenue for doing that and for setting standards and for determining um, how you know, how to inform providers and others about what quality assurance they should be doing and to set, you know, and what specifications are required and who are the trusted suppliers and so forth. Um, I think uh, there was another question and I think we'll, we'll answer that uh, some of it offline about um, antimicrobial stewardship, which, you know, we generally think of antibiotics when we think of, you know, an antibiotic resistance, when we think about antibiotics microbial stewardship and obviously substandard products or counterfeit products can contribute to the problem of resistance. 
um, if particularly the substandard ones when there's when they're not as effective. And so the Drug and Therapeutics Committee would have an, a, a role in setting the policies for um, for product use and um, and obviously some of the the selection of uh, the right specifications for the right for the right treatments, you know, for the right standard treatment guidelines. There was another question: How do we know if vaccines are substandard because of unqualified transport and storage conditions, but the packaging is still intact? I think that one, you know, for a lot of the medicine, and I don't know what your your all experience has been, but a lot of the vaccines do have vaccine vial monitors on them. The, the color changing monitors on the side of the vials, which would indicate their, their um, excursions of outside of the temperature, the required temperature requirements um, that would show whether or not the, uh, the, excuse me, the product has been exposed to any extreme that would affect its quality. So initiatives like the vaccine bio manager, which are a lot on a lot of the childhood vaccines now that um, are supplied through UNICEF and other organizations. Those are generally the way that the best way you can tell um, if, a, if a vaccine has been compromise. Um, and you can do some, some, some products visual inspection. If you're using um, contraceptive injectables, you know, whether or not it, the um, product can be uh, resuspended in, on shaking or not will tell you whether or not it's, um, it's actually still, um, still a, an effective product. Some of those, um, some of those other kinds of visual inspection aspects of of the product. Back to you, Greg. Okay, I'm actually, I'm just reviewing the questions and uh, I'm noticing uh, uh, Francois has been replying to a couple of the questions. Okay, I great. appreciate those responses. Um, I'm actually, I'm honestly trying to pick out another question that I think we could address and I'm not really coming up with one. I think we might want to catalog the remaining questions and then we can answer, we could take those offline, but Barbara, do you want to add anything or is there another question that you'd like to, to um, address? Mm -hmm. No, um, nothing, I've, and I think we're about to run out of time here. So I think we should wrap this up and um, take the, take summarize some of these questions offline in our follow-up email, but also we're going to, um, be putting some of these questions on the, hum the humanitarian commodities logistics um, community of practice um, discussion group and work on those there. So I think that I some of the questions maybe even the question about is there a basic criteria to check for the qualities of pharmaceutical products and we can probably um, come up with some um, tools and things that we would want to um, that could be used and some suggestions there and we can discuss that in the HCL website. So. Great, thanks Barbara. And yeah, I also was, I actually lost track of time. This has really been interesting and we really do appreciate uh, all of the participation with the chat, with the questions and with um, folks contributing some of the answers. So thanks again for that. So um, just to wrap up, we want to remind you again, you'll get, be getting a follow-up email with additional information and links to the resources. You'll get the link to the recording of this webinar. You will get a link for the signing up for the game and you'll get a uh, copy of the slides um, that we have been presenting. The part two webinar, again, tentatively scheduled for August 24th, we've seen in the chat that people are already planning to attend. We're very glad to see that or to hear that. Uh, and again, you look for the usual, uh, look through your usual channels for the announcements for that uh, webinar and the registration link. Really, we wanna thank everyone for making time to attend this webinar. We know that everyone's busy. We hope that the webinar has been interesting and beneficial to you. And of course, we cannot end without thanking everyone for the very important work that you're all doing, helping to respond to humanitarian crisis and emergency situations around the world. So thanks again to everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you.